old school bodybuilding clothing company. If it's been three and a half hours since you last ate protein, and now you're starting to freak out, you are old school. If watching someone sit on a hammer machine for five minutes between sets playing with their phone pisses you off, you are definitely old school. OSBBC.com for the hardest training athletes. I'm Dave Palumbo, founder of Species Nutrition. From my earliest bodybuilding days, I believed in only putting the best in my body. And that lives on in the Species Nutrition line of products. I put my name and reputation on every bottle of Species Nutrition products. If you want to be your absolute best, join the evolution. After working hard at the gym, you need a mattress that works as hard as you do. Spinaline has engineered the perfect mattress for you and your active lifestyle. Don't compromise your recovery with inferior sleep. Order your Spinaline mattress today. Hey guys, we're super excited to be here at the LA Fit Expo. It's our third year in a row. And uh, what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be launching a tasty pastry. It's a low carb Pop Tart. It's got three to four grams of net carbs. And we love this show. This is our best place to be in LA. Hey, this is the game Triple H from the WWE. You're watching RxMuscle.com, the truth in bodybuilding. Rx Television on RxMuscle.com. This is Ask Dave, better known as Hashtag Ask Dave. Your 30-minute question and answer show with Dave Palumbo. All your questions, diet, training, supplementation, IFE pros, news, whatever's on your mind, bodybuilding or otherwise, life, whatever in general, it is all on the table. So we now bring in Dave Palumbo. Dave, a couple of updates. One on a sadder note, uh, just uh, received word that uh, Mike Horn uh, has just passed away. I know you just told me this before we went on air. Yeah. Uh, he had been in a coma, and uh, we're sad for those who have not yet heard to report uh, that Mike Horn has moved on. Yeah, he had a... Um... A, a really bad heart attack uh, about a week or so ago. Maybe it was two weeks ago. He was in a coma, and I guess he had come out of the coma. But I don't, I, I don't know all the details. But I think there was very little brain activity, so the family um, made the decision to uh, remove the ventilator, and uh, yeah, he passed uh, peacefully. So, you know, very sad. You know, I, I've met Mike a, a lot of times. I've interviewed him. He was like a really good, like he's one of the good guys. You know, sometimes you know to just just guys that you like. No one has a bad word to say about the guy. He just loved bodybuilding. He competed. He worked with athletes, and you know, he just he really devoted his whole life to that. And so, uh, it's it's sad when you see people like that go. Look, you know, I always tell people you never know when it's your time. Um, the only thing you can do is try to get as many diagnostic tests as you get older as possible to see if you have any pre-existing conditions um, for you know blockages in the arteries and high blood pressure and blood sugar control issues or kidney function. I mean, that's all you can do. I mean, look, I caught my thyroid completely by accident. You know, thank God someone was watching over me up there. But, you know, at, at any moment it could happen. So appreciate the people around you. And, you know, as a community, as 
we're all brothers and sisters in iron and we all have to uh, support each other and that's why um, when things like this go wrong you have to really support the family and send out your prayers and that's exactly what we're doing and we're going to help another member of the community you're going to mention in a minute right now we have another person who uh, who is in need as well yeah no uh, well obviously first off first foremost uh, our warmest uh, thoughts uh, to Mike's family, his friends, and of course, all of his supporters. Uh, so yeah, it, obviously this happened last week, and I know it, it made the rounds on social media. Uh, and it's another bodybuilder that, you know, um, look, th this this bodybuilding community, the RX Muscle bodybuilding community, whenever someone has been in need, we have all stepped up to the cause um, and contrib contributed in our own ways. Uh, Bola Ojex uh, was training for the New York Pro six weeks out, I believe, uh, tore both quads uh, while squatting, um, and, and he is in need of support. So, Dave, you want to elaborate more? Yeah. Well, I know you, you once had a brief interaction with him as well. Yeah, and I, I've interviewed him before. Uh, Sean, yeah, Sean Ray called me. We talked today, and, um, you know, Bola, you know, had no health insurance, you know, like a lot of people who can't afford it. He didn't expect anything like this to happen. We never do. Um, look, I tore one quad. It's a pain in the ass to walk around with your legs stiff you know, for six, eight weeks and on crutches. When you tear both, you can't, you can't walk. You have to be in a wheelchair. So this guy can't do anything. He's going to have a lot of medical bills. It's a very expensive surgery. He really is in need of help. And you know what? When someone in our community is in need of help, we have to go out there and we have to contribute to that because we, we need to support our brothers uh, and sisters, like I said, in iron. And you know what the truth of the matter is? There is no health insurance for pro bodybuilders out there right now. I wish there was some kind of a plan that people could subscribe to at a very reasonable rate, but we don't have that. So when someone gets hurt and they have big medical bills, you know, we have to help them. Just like we helped Xavier Wills, his family, and we've helped innumerable other people. We'll put up the GoFundMe page, go to the page, even if you can only contribute 10 bucks, it all adds up. As a community, there's enough of us that if everyone gave $10, he would have all his medical bills paid for, no problem. And he's a good guy, and once again, uh, it could happen to any of us. You know, six weeks out from a show, you think you're going to be in your best shape of your life, you're feeling good, and then all of a sudden your whole life changes overnight. And you, and you be, go from being completely self-sufficient and self-reliant, and then, and then you lose all that. So very important support, uh, Bola, and uh, we'll put up that link. The uh, GoFundMe link is in the article description below, so click on it, and like Dave said, even if you contribute contribute ten dollars uh something very small obviously it all adds up and obviously it's going towards helping a you know fellow bodybuilder someone in our community someone who was just six weeks out from competing at the new york pro let's go to the questions the first two questions from the dave palumbo experience app the first question dave recently my wife was diagnosed with hypothyroidism it was prescribed uh level level thyroxin uh, is there an alternative to her fixing her hypothyroidism so she doesn't have to take that medication? Also, what would be the best type of diet to eat for this type of condition? Well, I, I can speak very uh, authoritatively on this subject because I'm on uh, 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 Levo or L-thyroxin or T4. Another, they're all the same thing. Uh, a lot of times people hear the term Synthroid. That's kind of the brand name, but a lot of people use the generic, myself included now. There's no reason to really use the, the name brand, um, Synthroid, but... It's T4. You give your body T4, your body converts what it needs into T3, and you hopefully, you know, if you once you dose it correctly, you you uh, you pretty much replace what your body would naturally produce. Now, mine uh, needed to be replaced because I had my thyroid gland removed. Now, I feel good. I, I I I'm interested to see what my thyroid levels are to see if he dosed it properly right off the bat. But a lot of people have to, you know, have some trial and error going on. Now, the truth is, once you're replaced, in other words, once you've replaced what you've had already, um, you your diet should be exactly the same. There's no difference. You've just, you know, basically given yourself synthetically what your body would normally produce naturally. And, and so thyroid is very easy to replace. Just like testosterone is kind of easy to replace too because you give yourself a dose and once you check your blood levels and they're, and they're in the normal range, even if you want to get the little normal high, you're good to go. My suggestion is when you're dosing thyroid, hopefully you have a baseline of what you were prior to taking the uh, replacement. I do, luckily, before surgery. So I'm going to try to replace myself at the same level. So even though I wasn't high normal, people think, oh, Dave has such a great metabolism. Thyroid is, is, is important for metabolic rate. 
But, but having a higher amount of thyroid doesn't necessarily mean you're a leaner person. And I'll explain why. Because all thyroid does is it's like a master metabolism regulator. It says, all right, it tells all your bodily processes to do certain things. But if, my, if I have more muscle or my muscle cell mitochondria is oxidized fat better than the next person, okay, taking more thyroid will amp up my machinery better than the next person. So... I might not need as much thyroid hormone because my metabolic machinery in my muscle cells that, that actually does all the fat burning and the fat oxidizing is better. Whereas someone else, you know, like, you know, you might take a woman who has less muscle, maybe their metabolic, you know, uh, fat burning potential is not as good. Just by giving them more thyroid hormone is not going to make them ripped, you know, like contest shape. So you still might have to diet and stuff like that. So that's why it's not... Thyroid is not the only indicator of how lean you are. And just because you have a high natural you know, T3 output, you know, T4 to T3 conversion, then your T3 is high, doesn't mean you're going to be ripped. And that's why a lot of people get this, this belief that if I take GH and T3, I'm going to be shredded. Well, guess what? If you don't diet and you have a terrible metabolism on top of that and you're insulin resistant, you're not going to get shredded on those, those drugs. It'll make it easier but you're still gonna have to diet and you're gonna still have to take your supplements to sensitize your insulin receptors and all those things that go along with it. So it's not just you know the do all or end all. The key is I would recommend it, and I don't know what's wrong with his wife, if he has, she has Hashimoto's, which would be an autoimmune disease where, where the immune system kills off your thyroid progressively, or her thyroid just crapped out on her, I don't know. You know, it, you know. That could be a genetic you know time clock that went off. The bottom line is there's no reason to suffer with low thyroid. If you have low T, uh, T4, T3 output in your body, and usually it's the T4 output that's low, and then you're not, because if you don't have enough T4, you can't convert it to T3, then my suggestion is exactly what the doctor did. Put you on replacement and don't worry about it. Once they get your levels right with blood work, you're gonna feel good, and then, there's, and then just stay on it. Now, if, you're, if your thyroid gland is progressively getting worse, you might have to up your dose as your thyroid gets worse and worse, but if it's, you know, an all or none situation, once they replace you and dose you right, you should be good for life. Second question again from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. Um, beetroot juice. How good is drinking beetroot juice as a pre-workout for a good pump? <laughs> I have a, a funny story, and I've told this before. I don't know if people remember it or not. I used to, um, I was into juicing vegetables for, for a while before I had kids and I had time to clean the juicer. And I would go to the supermarket a couple times a week and I'd buy all kinds of different vegetables, cucumbers and celery and broccoli and lettuce and kale. And uh, I would buy beets and, and carrots and I would juice all this stuff at, at night, usually right before bed. That was my thing. I would do my juicing, I would take my fiber lines and I'd go to sleep. And that was my routine because I would wash it at night, I'd have more time. And one night I had this big, huge beet. And if you ever cut open a beet, Okay, it bleeds like purple everywhere, uh, juices, and it's a real mess. So I'm like, you know what? This thing's, I'm not keeping, I'm not saving this in a plastic bag. It's getting, I'm just gonna throw, I threw the whole beat in there. It was like this big, literally. And you know, a beat this big juices down to like, you know, a half a cup. It's not a lot of fluid, but it was really concentrated, obviously. And I threw all the other vegetables in, and I had this nice big glass. I gulped it down like I normally do. I'm telling you, 15 minutes later, I was, I wanted to go to the gym. I was wired out of my mind. I thought I, I somehow took some caffeine or something like that. My veins were popping out. Beetroot juice or beetroot extract or beets in general have a lot of, uh, um, I guess, nitric oxide producing chemicals in them, okay, or, or nutrients in them. And you will get a very big nitric oxide surge when you do it, especially when you, when you, when you juice a beet this big. So it definitely works. I, matter of fact, my, my first pre-workout we ever made, Nitrolyze, which we discontinued and now we're coming up with another one, had beetroot extract in there because it, does, it is pretty potent. It's, you know, it's like on, in, in, on probably beetroot, citrulline, arginine, those are all really good ni generalized nitric oxide you know, releasers. So it, it works, but I wouldn't take it at night. I'm telling you, I couldn't sleep that night. I was, I was so wired out of my mind. <laughs> um, why someone would use it, I don't know, but I would use it you know, prior to the gym probably if you wanted to, or just get a pre-workout that has it in there already. It's a lot easier than, than juicing a beat, you know, that's for sure. Let's go to our Instagram questions. Again, if you're not already following us, our handle is official underscore RX muscle. If you're watching us for the first time on YouTube, Hit the subscribe button below, hit the notification bell. You're not going to miss any of our upcoming 
shows, segments, or whatever it is that we have going on on the channel. Uh, if you like what you're watching, hit the like button. Uh, comment below. Obviously, that helps. And as always, we thank you for your support. Let's go to TJ the Gent. Dave, so I always see people posting pictures of huge plates of sushi or some kind of huge carb meal and just say leg day in it as a caption. <laughs> uh, is it better to have a high carb day the day before legs to get a great pump on leg day or post leg day workout for recovery if you had to choose one? I always felt that the, whatever I ate the day before really prepared me for that day. Because um, I'm the kind of guy, if I eat too much before I work out, I, it gets me like nauseous. So if I had like my cheat meal, let's say I was, my legs were my good body parts. So that, that wasn't usually the case. But if I wanted to have a good leg workout, if I had my cheat meal Saturday night, maybe Sunday morning would be my cheat meal. You know, and I would still have some, or, or Sunday afternoon, I would still eat, you know, carb meals and I would still have, you know, my normal nutrition on Sunday. But it, from that massive cheat meal the night before, I, I you tend to get really glycogen loaded from that, um, and that's what worked for me. You know, usually you're, you're a little bloated too. That all that sodium and water tends to make you a little stronger as well, especially when you're dieting. If you're dieting and you're really glycogen depleted because you know you're on low carbs, and then you have a, a cheat meal, you're definitely gonna have a good workout the next day. I, if you're car glycogen depleted and you have a cheat meal, even if you had it Saturday morning, I don't think by Saturday afternoon you'll be that much carved up. I think you almost need that whole, you know, overnight type of thing going on to really assimilate all those nutrients and, and all those carbohydrates and put them in the right place. So I would opt for the, the night before. Let's go to Tommy TQB. How much muscle can you actually can actually be built while in a calorie deficit? I always see coaches claiming their athletes quote grew into this prep. Is this legitimate? It depends what the calorie deficit is, is of. I mean, if you're at a calorie deficit of protein, you're probably not going to grow, you know? Um, usually what you do is, I notice it in younger people. Guys that have just, or women that have just started out, maybe they haven't really done a lot of drug cycles before. Maybe they're, they're using a little bit more than they've normally used or just starting to use some stuff. Uh, they're eating a high protein diet. They finally got their diet down pat. They're training well. They don't have as much stress. They're sleeping well. And just everything clicks and they and then they put on size um, while they're pre prepping and it's usually not a lot but you know even if you gain th three four pounds you know while you're getting ready for a show that's pretty impressive because most people are just trying to maintain muscle you don't necessarily see that happen a lot now i see it also in people who eat terribly in the off season you know these guys i'm talking about and girls that they're, they're horrendous eaters they miss meals off season they don't make that much progress but then when they diet, they, they buckle down and they eat right, and they train, they sleep, they rest, they don't go out as much. And then those people tend to put muscle on as well because they're, they're actually eating more food and higher quality food on a regular basis. So they're maximizing you know, what they're doing. All that, those people are basically getting a message to them saying, can, that, can you imagine how much muscle you would put on if you actually maximized your off season? So the, to answer the question, you can, but it's, that's not the goal. And if it happens, great, but don't expect it, you know, and don't go into a prep and try to go to a coach and say, look, I got 16 weeks to my show. I want to gain five pounds of muscle and, and get shredded. That's an unrealistic, you know, goal. If it happens, great, but don't put the expectations on that because what, it'll eventually, what you'll do is you'll wind up eating too much food, thinking I got to eat more because I'm going to grow, and then you'll never get in shape. So that question was more heading into a show. This one is more about post show it's a good it's a good question it's a good but i want to expand a little bit more yeah. on it uh it's from max your workout his question is what workouts should you do post show when going back into the gym uh circuit or split training so i guess if you could expand upon that yeah. what was your typical i guess routine right. post show um intensity in terms of right. what you would do right yeah Th this is this will be our uh this will be <laughs> this will be the name of the show probably you're gonna name it the what I would do is when I would come back, a lot of people would take two, three, four weeks off. I said, you know what? That's ridiculous. If I take that much time off, okay, yeah, my body's going to get rested and healed up, which probably would have helped me long term. But short term, I'm missing a window where I'm eating a tremendous amount of food. My body's going to compens hypercompensate for the fact that I've been on such a lower calorie diet and I could actually grow. And the ironic thing was that I would actually, after a show, go off drugs. I would like usually start my post cycle, you know, HCG. Because I had so much in my system already from, you know, leading up to the show that for the next three, four weeks, 
it's like you're on a cycle anyway. And what I would do is I would obviously increase my food tremendously. You know, I would be eating a lot more carbs. My protein intake would go high. I would have snacks in between. And I was training. But the way my training went was I would usually take, so let's say if you have a Saturday show you're doing, you're, you're not training Thursday and Friday and then Saturday. Sunday, you know, I would probably take off because I'm dehydrated. And then Monday, I'd be back in the gym. Um, and what I would do is I would go and I would train one body part and I would pick like two exercises. So let's say I'm going to go train chest. I would do incline press and I would do like flat dumbbell presses. And I would literally do like five or six sets and that's it. I would leave. Because the pump you're going to get is going to be unbelievable because you're eating more food. And it's like your body is like hyper compensating because here you were like almost starving to death. You had no extra anything. Your body was using probably a lot of the protein you're eating as, as fuel. Now you have an overabundance, your body's storing everything, but what it's doing is it's trying to store things as muscle because it was so worried about losing it before. And your body has this, what we call, anabolic rebound effect off of the diet, and you can grow. And you don't have to do a crazy amount of stuff, and you don't have to try to break. You shouldn't go into the gym the first two weeks and try to break strength records because you'll tear something because your body is beat up. You'll grow anyway. Just f squeeze that muscle. Put enough weight on that, you use, you use really good form, full range of motion, eat and rest. So I would train maybe like each time I'd go in, I would pick a body part, chest, you know, maybe do some arms one day, do legs, shoulders, back. And you know, I would probably, you know, if I'm going to train on the seven day week, I would maybe train, you know, four of those days. And I would do that for like the next month until my body kind of started feeling normal again. And I would put a lot of weight on and, and a lot of good quality weight. And I would try to eat mostly good food, but I would eat, you know, if I want to eat some junk food, I would eat some junk food. I just wouldn't make it, I would still stay structured in how I ate my meals. I think a lot of guys after a show just go crazy and they just don't have, they don't even know what they're doing. How many meals did you eat? Oh, I think I ate twice, but I've been snacking all day on junk food. That's not how you grow. You've got to stay structured. Just make the food more enjoyable. Eat the food you want. Go out to eat if you want. You know, order in, go to McDonald's, but always think protein, fat, and carbs, you know, so that you're getting enough of your macros that you need to, to grow. And, that, and that's the key, you know. If you have a slow metabolism, you get fat really easy, then, then don't go crazy with the, with the fast foods and stuff like that. Try to eat mostly clean foods. But you will get a good rebound, like I said. And you know what I found? When I went off the drugs, okay, and tapered off and did my PCT, I actually got, had a better appetite because I wasn't as toxic and my body grew better because now my liver wasn't worried about having to break down all these drugs and I actually felt better and my training was better and my appetite was, was fresh and so that whole rebound effect can really be guided to in a positive way if you're smart about how you do it. Let's go to Todd Apaya. Question about Jimmy the Bull, of course, new episode of After Hours live right now on the channel. How much could Jimmy the Bull legit bench back in the day? I mean, a full rep raw where the bar touches his chest and no spotters touch on the bar. I know he did huge weight for partial reps. Yeah. I, I think, I, I truly believe, and you got to remember, the, the raw bench press record was not that high back then. Um, I, I think he was capable... I've seen him do eight, 800, but a little sloppy in just a tank top, okay? But I, I think that he would have, in competition, been able to do 700 pounds, which would have easily been the world bench press record raw at that point. And he was supposed to do it. It was all set up. It was being paid for. If they flew him down to Florida, and then they didn't have the official judges there, which would have meant that if he had done it, it wouldn't have counted. So he never did the thing because he felt like, you know, they, they, they screwed up on him. I wish he would have, even though it you know, even though it went to count to just to have the video of it, you know. But he didn't. He was a he was very he's very very strong. Very, uh, you, I mean, you, you know, just the, the kind of strength that didn't it wasn't proportionate to how much he weighed. Like when you looked at him, you didn't think he could be that strong. But that just goes to show you that there's there's more to strength than just how much muscle you have and and, and you know how heavy you are. Uh, there's a tendon, you know, there's a, there's a kinesiological aspect to, to benching. And he was just crazy, crazy strong. And he had tendons of steel. You know, my body would have snapped, you know, uh, doing the weight he did. And he was able to handle it. And so pro I would say 700 would have been legitimate. Um, this one's from Nivek J. So he said he had a, uh, I just want to make sure I see. Yeah, he had a stroke uh, in 2016. Any ideas to combat atrophy due to stroke? Uh, so five years ago, 
Large amount of strength has returned to the affected side, but noticeable difference in size, as well as some mind and muscle connection or weakness with the calf and hamstrings uh, on that side. You know, it, it, it's a hard question to answer because, you know, when you have a stroke, obviously something, there's a disconnect with the nerves. The nerves are not there, and that's why you can't feel those muscles and make them contract the way you want to. And if you can't do that in the gym, then it's pretty hard. Now, there's potentially some benefit to using some of these electromuscular stimulation machines. You know, you put those pads on there to make the muscles contract. But that might help you just get function back, but I don't know if it's going to necessarily help you be able to contract the muscle that has lost innervation to it. So I know it's not the, it's, I'm not answering the question directly because there really is no answer. I think in some people's cases, they'll get back the use of it. In some people, they won't. The key is to try, okay? That means that do everything you possibly can to get do all your physical therapy, go religiously, do your EMS, muscular stimulation, do everything that they tell you to do because the more you develop those nerve, mind, muscle pathways, sometimes they can reestablish themselves or even provide collateral, you know, innervation uh, pathways that will enable you to still move the muscles and, you know, by learning new ways to do it. Uh, so, once again, Everyone is different. Some people get, I, you know, they tell people, yeah, you're never going to walk again. I see these guys, they're walking and they're running around afterwards. And then you have other people, they say that, you know, you have a very good chance of recovering and they never do. So it, it's hard to say per se, but the key is you got to try. Um, Melon Fit, Dave, how come you don't have uh, painless pumps on your website anymore? You know, I do have painless pumps, by the way. I have painless pumps Gen 4. I'm selling the latest generation. I don't, I don't have the... I, I'm out of Chris Clark's, the, um, uh, the uh, pump and pose synthesize, because in Germany, they're having you know, supply problems with the whole COVID thing. So the, suppl the demand here is very high and the supply is very low. So as soon as I get 50 bottles and they're gone like overnight, uh, that's always the case, right? Everyone wants what they can't have. Uh, I don't know why they can't produce it, but like I said, there's a lot. You know, I went to, to get a car the other day. My lease is up next month, and I want to get a new uh, BMW. So I was looking at the X7. I have an X5. The X7 is a little bigger. I can get my kids in there, put the car seats in there. And, and they're like back ordered. Like, you can't even get, a, a get one if I want one. They're, they're going to have to like extend my lease a couple of months just to wait until the car comes in. And you know what the problem is? The factories, and the funny thing is, the X, the, um, SUV BMWs are made in Spartanburg, South Carolina. But because of COVID, no one was working. They were running skeletal, skeleton crews there. They couldn't produce the number of cars they normally do. And everyone still needs a car to drive around. And even though there's COVID, you still need to have a car. If your lease is up, you got to have a new car. So there's, there's not enough supply. The demand is high. So, of course, now they're not giving deals. Uh, and you got to wait. So that's the same thing. It's, when you don't have people working in the factories all over the world, you're going to have a, a supply problem of a lot of products. And uh, that's what we're noticing now in, in today's marketplace, that certain things are scarce. I know even like building supplies, because in Cape Coral here, we have, uh, you know, it's one of the fastest growing cities. They can't put, they can't build these houses because they don't have enough, they don't have the materials. They can't get, a two by four is like crazy expensive now, and they can't even get cinder block. Um, because they, or cement, it's like crazy that, they, that this, even the bagel store guy told me he couldn't get, some of the ingredients to make bagels at, at the level he needs to. And so they're, they're not making enough bagels. So we're noticing, you know, now a year later that we're running out of raw materials. Hopefully now people can get back to work now that the vaccine is out and that we'll, we'll catch up. Speaking of getting back to work, let me see if I can find this uh, question so I could attribute it to the, the, the question was about um, the UK. Gyms have been closed there for the better part of, it's probably been over a year now. Um, I, I, we do we have fans in the UK, and you know, talking to them, they're telling us that the gyms are still closed there. Everything is very restricted over there in the United Kingdom right now. Apparently, aside from supermarkets and drugstores, seemingly nothing else is open. So the question, I can't find it, but the question was more or less, um, what would you suggest in the sense where you're talking about a very, very long layoff from the gym in, in terms of uh, staying lean? Uh, what would you suggest? Home workouts. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking. When we asked this question before, it was about five to six months. We're right. not talking about well over a year right, right. Uh, in the UK. You know, uh, 
my my solution, unfortunately, is not going to help. It's not going to be uh, favorable by gym owners. But you know, a lot of gyms have gone out of business because of this. And we, I was talking about this, and they're saying that from statistically, someone sent me a study. Uh, they're saying a third of the gym memberships of people who went to the gym prior to COVID will probably never go back. So we've lost a third of gym members out there. Obviously, gyms can't sustain themselves. So a lot have gone out of business or aren't in, on the way out. And now a lot of new gyms are kind of trying to jump into that space because they have a, a, an advantage because landlords are giving better deals now and they're, and they're buying these equipment uh, up from these older gyms at pennies on the dollar. And so we're going to see a lot of new blood in the gym business. I don't know if that's good or bad. I guess you know it, it is what it is. Um, but if I was you know in today's marketplace and I was competing with with what's going on out there, I probably would have had some hookups. But I think I would have taken all the money that you know I would invest you know in gym memberships, and I would probably take some of the money that I would you know normally use on other things, and I would I would actually buy my own equipment for my house. You know I would definitely I would definitely buy the free weight stuff that I would need like a power rack, um, bench press enough weight to do what I needed to do from a squat, deadlift, bench press, shoulder press standpoint. I'd buy enough dumbbells to do my arms and uh, biceps, triceps, and side laterals. And, you know, I would, I would just have this backup and I would make it, I don't care if I had to put it in my bedroom, you know, because I had a small house or an apartment. You got to get it done. After, you know, it's fine when you have a month or two that you can't make it to the gym, when you, but when you see this is ongoing, and it might not be getting better ever. It's you got to have backup in your house if you're if you're a bodybuilder who's serious about what they're doing. Free weights are not that expensive, you know. Yeah, if you have to go buy machines and stuff like that, yeah, you can spend you know a hundred grand. But buying free weight sets, you could even build your own power cage. Watch Evan Santapani's video. Him and his dad built you know welded their own you know, power cage. But you get a power rack, you know. You can do your squats, you can do your shoulder presses, dead, you can do everything there. And you just need enough weight. You, probably for, I would say probably for two grand, you probably can get everything you need. Uh, now, I'm not, you know, I haven't gone out there and priced all this stuff, but you know, the dumbbells might be the most expensive part. And you can get these dumbbells, and I have, we did one on a commercial one, uh, we have it over there, and it's like an adjustable, you can kind of pick, you know, you know what you want to selectorize, you know, dumbbells. They're not that expensive. You could probably, and if you're if you're thrifty and you can get on you know eBay and look at these you know check out these these auctions they have for gyms that are closing, you could buy stuff for pennies on the dollar. I would equip my house with ex what I need so that I have no excuses about not being able to work out. I mean that that's at this point in time we know that you have to do that. If you don't, you're stupid because now you're being leaving yourself vulnerable to whether the government decides to close or open gyms and they can on a whim close them for six weeks eight weeks out of nowhere and then you got you screwed so now you know go out there build yourself a little home gym find a little space in your house you could put it in and and have that as backup and you know what the best thing that can happen to you is you never have to use it the gym opens up and you don't ever need it but at least you know it's there in case you do need it a couple of more questions. JDG Bear Shockey, uh, Testalize, any additional benefits for a natural bodybuilder to take more than six caps a day? You know, the six caps per day uh, dosage that I kind of tested myself out seems to work really well, but some people who are really high DHT converters probably can benefit from more because it does, it does have a DHT um, blocker in there that inhibits the conversion of testosterone to DHT. Also, women who are really estrogenic tend to really do well on a little bit more too because it, it doesn't prevent their estrogen production, but it does bind up extra estrogen and kind of draw it out of the body. But I would start with three pills twice a day and see how you do. And you can go for blood work and test your levels and you'll know if you're good. If your testosterone goes up, your DHT goes down, your estrogen is, is manageable, then you're good. You know, if you're still having you know, side effect issues, a lot of people use testalized women because they get acne or they have hair thinning. And they, they know. You, they know when they hit that sweet spot. Usually it's the six pills. But if, if they need more, you can do three pills you know, three times a day. You shouldn't need more than nine. I think the six pills per day, which is a month, makes that bottle last a month, is ideal. But everyone's a little different. So you got to play around with it. There's, not, there's no negative to taking more. Put it that way. Last question. Let's go to Swit1982. Do you think that Antoine Vaillant and Ian Valier have the potential to break into the top three at the Olympia? 
Absolutely. I, I think uh, I've been, I'm a big ad, I was a big fan of Ian's physique from the moment he turned pro and I saw him in, down in Mexico when I interviewed him for the first time and I've been, you know, I've had him on the show innumerable times and I've told him, I said, you have all the tools to go, you know, very, very far, if not all the way. And by his own admission, his head was the, probably the, you know, the thing that he really needed to get in, uh, in line and it seems like at the end of last season he, he really did it. Um, I think he kind of worked out the nerves and all the kinks, and I, I, I think we're going to see him, you know, place very high this year. And I think that he's going to continue to get better. He's still young. I think within the next three to four years, he's going to keep moving up and moving up. And I think a lot of, you know, there's still a lot of older guys that are going to start retiring, and he's going to just, he'll be one of the new guys that will be in there for probably the next 10, 15 years competing. And he'll definitely, I, I have no doubt that he'll be a top, you know, five guy reliably every single year with his physique. I think Antoine has the tool set too, if he can keep his head together. You know, he's got that really nice structure. He's a great poser. He needed to get he needs to get a little bigger. And as he keeps adding more and more size in the right places, he, I think he can go very far as well. He's got a freaky physique, you know. If he puts it all together, he's got like a Samir Benut, you know, physique. If he puts it all together, he's so pretty his physique and the way he presents it, he could go definitely he'll be top five at the Olympia. I have no doubt about that. That's going to do for this episode of Ask Dave. A reminder, if you click the link below, uh, it is to help support Bolo Ojax for both his quads uh, training for the New York Pro. He was six weeks out of the New York Pro, uh, and he needs our help. So when we've done this in the past, when we've had bodybuilders in need, uh, this community has stepped up and stepped up big. So we expect the absolute same for you to do that for Bolo Ojax. Again, the link is down below in the article description uh, for the GoFundMe for Bolo Ojax. Um, I believe the goal is about 19000 for you know everything he needs done with his quads. Uh, we're steadily progressing along. Uh, as Dave mentioned at the top of the broadcast, Sean Ray personally called him uh, earlier today. So obviously it means a lot to him. And uh, we're trying to get the bodybuilding community to rally behind him. So again, click the link below. Even if you donate as little as $10, we, that adds up. Uh, and that's going to go a long way in helping him recover and hopefully getting back on that stage in no time soon. For Tyler Shore and Dave Palumbo, I'm Sadiq Faruqi. We'll see you next time.